This is a close reading of a poem by William Wordsworth, commonly referred to as Tintern Abbey. The complete title of this poem is Lines Composed a Few Miles Above Tintern Abbey on Revisiting the Banks of the Wye During a Tour, July 13, 1798. And this is a long title for a poem, but it gives us a lot of information about the poem and what to expect from the poem. In a way, this title is an invitation to us to look behind the scenes of the poem and to picture the poet at his craft, to picture the poet revisiting the banks of the Wye River and gazing down upon this landscape and scribbling down these verses for us to read. And so the title to this poem signals to us that we should expect the speaker of this poem to be that poet that we're picturing upon the banks of the Y. So let's keep that in mind as we begin to read through this poem. Five years have passed, five summers with the length of five long winters. The poet has been absent from this place, has been gone for a long time. He's revisiting after an absence of five years, and it's been a long five years. And again, I hear these waters rolling from their mountain springs with a soft inland murmur. Once again, do I behold these steep and lofty cliffs that on a wild secluded scene impress thoughts of more deep seclusion and connect the landscape with the quiet of the sky. There are such great contrasts between the soft murmuring waters and the steep and lofty cliffs. These cliffs which in their seclusion, in what they obscure from view and what is obscured from view in them, impress thoughts of more deep seclusion on an already secluded scene. They also connect the landscape with the sky, bringing a unity to this scene, even despite all of these disparate elements, even despite these great contrasts between the waters and the cliffs themselves. The day is come when I again repose here under this dark sycamore and view these plots of cottage ground, these orchard tufts, which at this season with their unripe fruits are clad in one green hue and lose themselves mid groves and copses. We can picture the poet reposing, reclining, sitting under this tree, gazing down upon this landscape, looking upon these plots of cottage ground and these orchard tufts. The fruits on these trees aren't yet ripe. They haven't gained their color. They're still green. And so they blend in with the greenery that surrounds them. Once again, I see these hedgerows, hardly hedgerows, little lines of sportive wood run wild, these pastoral farms green to the very door. And so it's the same thing with these hedgerows and these pastoral farms. These are markers of human habitation. They're marks that humans leave on the landscape. But here, in this early season, or at this particular moment, they don't seem so much like marks. They don't stick out. They don't stand out from among the natural landscape. And wreaths of smoke sent up in silence from among the trees with some uncertain notice as might seem of vagrant dwellers in the houseless woods or of some hermit's cave where by his fire the hermit sits alone. Even these human inhabitants in this landscape, they don't seem to be intruding upon nature. They seem to form a part of the landscape that the poet is observing. So what is it that the poet thinks and feels? What is it that the landscape gives the poet to think as he's observing all of these natural forms? Well, that's what we're going to learn in the next stanza. 
These beauteous forms, through a long absence, have not been to me as is a landscape to a blind man's eye. The poet's been away from this scene for a long time. He's been far away from this place. But he says, even in his absence, these beauteous forms, the forms of the steep and lofty cliffs, these orchard tufts, these murmuring waters, haven't been to him as is a landscape to a blind man's eye. And we wonder, what is a landscape to a blind man's eye? And it's not a landscape to a blind man, but a landscape to a blind man's eye. And I think we would have to say that to that eye, a landscape would be invisible, would be unobserved. So to this poet, these beauteous forms have not been unobserved, have not been invisible, even though he's far away from them, even though he's been away from them for five years. And how can that be? He says, but oft in lonely rooms and mid the din of towns and cities, I have owed to them in hours of weariness sensations sweet. So even when he's surrounded by all the bustle of city life, all of the cares and concerns of city living, when he's alone, he can enjoy the sweet sensations that these beauteous forms give to him. He's able to feel these sensations sweet felt in the blood and felt along the heart. These are physical sensations. They're corporeal. They're felt in the body, in the blood. But not only. And passing even into my purer mind with tranquil restoration. So these sweet sensations are also conceptual. They're also pleasures of the mind. They're felt by the mind or they're enjoyed by the mind as well as by the body. Feelings, too, of unremembered pleasure. So not only are these sensations brought about by these beauteous forms in their absence, but there are also these feelings, feelings of unremembered pleasure, perhaps a little bit less distinct, somewhat more vague, but seemingly still very important such, perhaps, as have no slight or trivial influence on that best portion of a good man's life, his little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and of love. Somehow, these feelings of unremembered pleasure brought about by these beauteous forms in nature have allowed the poet to act upon kindness and, to lo and, and love and to do and to perform these acts which form the best portion of a good man's life. The enjoyment of these beauteous forms has made him a moral being, a moral person. Nor less, I trust, to them I may have owed another gift. And this is one more thing that the poet owes to these beauteous forms, owes to this landscape. Of aspect more sublime, that blessed mood in which the burden of the mystery, we wonder what is this burden of the mystery? What is this mystery that is such a burden? in which the heavy and the weary weight of all this unintelligible world is lightened. This world is unintelligible to us. We try to make sense of it. We try to make sense of what goes on around us. We try to make sense of what happens to us and to other people. But there's a senselessness that endures. We're unable to make sense of everything. We're unable to make it intelligible. And that resistance, that mystery is a burden. It's a heavy and a weary weight. 
that this mood, this blessed mood, lightens. And that's what makes it so sublime, right? This mood that is owed to these beauteous forms lightens this burden. That serene and blessed mood in which the affections gently lead us on. And here it's the affections that take center stage, that take the leading role, that guide us by the hand gently, not forcefully. Until the breath of this corporeal frame and even the motion of our human blood almost suspended, we are laid asleep in body and become a living soul. Now this is becoming quite mystical, but it seems that this blessed mood, this blessed and serene mood, takes us out of ourselves, makes us a living soul, brings us to the point of death, right? Since our breath and our blood is almost suspended. It's an ecstatic mood. It's a sort of out-of-body experience that the poet is describing that he owes to these beauteous forms. You can see that this is a rather extreme reaction or response to the nature, the landscape that he observes. He becomes a living soul. While with an eye made quiet by the power of harmony and the deep power of joy, we see into the life of things. In this blessed and serene mood, not only do we become a living soul, but we're able now to see what we weren't able to see. We're able to, to see in a different way. We're able to see into the life of things and not because our eye is made more vivid or more piercing, but rather because it's been made quiet. It's been subdued by the power of joy, by the power of harmony. Now, you might be somewhat skeptical of what the poet's been saying about these beauteous forms and what he owes to them, this serene mood which allows us to become a living soul and to see into the life of things. And it seems that the poet recognizes this himself and he begins the next stanza saying, if this be but a vain belief. So there seems to be some uncertainty within the poet himself who said all of this with a great deal of conviction regarding what he owes to nature, what he owes to these beauteous forms. But he doesn't seem to be entirely dogmatic. He admits some little doubt. But he continues, Yet, oh, how oft in darkness and amid the many shapes of joyless daylight, when the fretful stir unprofitable and the fever of the world have hung upon the beatings of my heart, how oft in spirit have I turned to thee, O Sylvan Y, thou wanderer through the woods, how often has my spirit turned to thee. The poet is addressing the Y, the river, directly now and saying, how often in these deep and dark moments of joyless daylight, he's been able to turn to the river, turn to these beauteous forms, which he's able to bring up into his mind and to feel in these sensations sweet, bringing him some peace, some solace, some joy. Right? Joy where there's only joyless daylight, when there's only fretful stir. So he says to himself, well, even if this is a vain belief, there must be some truth to what I'm saying, to what I've felt, what I've been able to take advantage of, what I've felt so strongly all this time. And now the poet brings us back to the present, back to this landscape. He says, And now, with gleams of half-extinguished thought, with many recognitions dim and faint, and somewhat of a sad perplexity, the picture of the mind revives again. 
all this time that the poet's been away, he's been able to feed on, on this picture of the mind, on these beauteous forms, but they've grown dim and faint. They've become half extinguished in this sad perplexity. But now, returning to the source, he's able to revive the picture of the mind once again. While here I stand not only with a sense of present pleasure, but with pleasing thoughts that in this moment, in this moment, there's life and food for future years. So while he's here in the present, he's able to experience these sweet sensations, he's able to enjoy the moment, but he also recognizes that he's storing up life and food for those future years in which he's going to be away. Who knows how long he's going to be away from this landscape? Another five years, perhaps longer, but he's storing up life and food for those future years. And so I dare to hope, though changed, no doubt, from what I was when first I came among these hills. He hopes that in those future years he'll be able to feed on this life and this food that he's storing up. Even though he's different now than he was five years ago. And perhaps he's going to be different yet again in the future. But his relationship to nature now isn't quite the same as it was five years ago. When like a row I bounded o'er the mountains, by the sides of the deep rivers and the lonely streams, wherever nature led, five years ago he was like a row, like a part of nature just bounding over these hills, being led by nature wherever it would lead. More like a man flying from something that he dreads than one who sought the thing he loved. Back then, five years ago, this younger poet was just being led by nature in this thoughtless abandon, just running, running away from something that's chasing you, not even seeking something that you're after, not even seeking something that you love, just fleeing, flight. For nature then, the coarser pleasures of my boyish days and their glad animal movements all gone by, to me was all in all. There was something all-consuming about nature to the poet five years ago. Back then, in his boyish days, he would revel in nature. He would enjoy these coarser pleasures, their glad animal movements. We can imagine perhaps just rolling around in the dirt and mud or jumping into the river, just immersing yourself in nature, becoming a part of it. That was what the poet was like five years ago in his boyish days. Five years later, he's older, he's more mature, and now he doesn't engage in these coarser pleasures anymore. He's grown up, and so his relationship to nature has changed. I cannot paint what then I was, the sounding cataract haunted me like a passion, the tall rock, the mountain, and the deep and gloomy wood, their colors and their forms were then to me an appetite. So again, this all-consuming quality of nature, it's haunting him. The passion haunts him. It's almost as if with the pleasure there's pain, there's this indistinguishable quality to the pleasure that he receives from nature. It's an appetite. It's instinctual. You respond to it. You, you, you just react to nature's forms. A feeling and a love that had no need of a remoter charm. 
There's, there's nothing remote, there's nothing distant about this appetite, about this charm. It's just immediate. It's unmediated. There's nothing from the mind, from the intellect, from conceptual understanding that intervenes in this younger poet's enjoyment of nature. Not any interest unborrowed from the eye. Everything is from the eye, from the senses. Everything is sensual, sensory. But the poet says, that time is past, and all its aching joys are now no more, and all its dizzy raptures. This time is past. He's, he's no longer in the same state. He's no longer the same person, and he no longer relates to nature in this same unmediated, raw fashion. It's kind of this being so close with nature, too close, aching joys, dizzy raptures, this flesh to flesh pressing into nature. It's no longer like that. But, the poet says, not for this faint eye, nor mourn, nor murmur. It's not something to be upset about. It's not something that the poet grieves over. Other gifts have followed. For such loss, I would believe, abundant recompense. He's lost this immediacy with nature, but he's gained something else. He's gained something in return. For such loss, abundant recompense. For I have learned to look on nature, not as in the hour of thoughtless youth. What has he gained? What has the poet gained in this intervening five years? He's learned to look on nature differently. It's not that raw gaze. It's not that unmediated participation in nature. It's now a look that has been learned. He's, he's learned to look on nature not as in the hour of thoughtless youth. Now it's, now it's more thoughtful. Now there's something more mindful, more conceptual about his relationship with nature and his enjoyment of it. But hearing oftentimes the still sad music of humanity, nor harsh nor grating, though of ample power to chasten and subdue, He's learned to look on nature, and, and his tutor, his teacher, has been this still sad music of humanity. It's taught him in subduing him, in chastening him. He's now no longer wild like a roe bounding over the mountains. He's more tame. He's more subdued. And in this being subdued, He's able to look on nature more thoughtfully, more mindfully. And perhaps more spiritually as well. He says, And I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns, and the round ocean, and the living air, and the blue sky, and in the mind of man. The speaker has felt this presence, and this is something new. This is something that uh, the poet five years ago wasn't aware of, but now in how he's learned to look upon nature, he's able to see and he's able to feel this presence and feel this sense sublime of this interfusion of all the elements of nature and everything within nature, everything in the universe, it seems, the round ocean, the living air, the dwelling place of this presence this spiritual presence is all of these things, all of these places, and also the mind of man. 
There's a divinity to the mind of man as well, to thought. A motion and a spirit. This is still this presence that the poet has learned to feel. A motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought, and rolls through all things. There's this universal spirit, a spirit that interconnects, a spirit that is expressed in the interfusion of all things that the poet has learned to feel and to observe. Therefore, the poet says, therefore am I still a lover of the meadows and the woods and the mountains. Therefore am I still, right? Because the poet is different now than he was five years ago. His relationship with nature has changed. His way of relating to nature has changed. He's learned to look on nature differently but he's learned to appreciate and to sense a different aspect of nature, not this thoughtless abandon, but now more thoughtful, more spiritual as well. Therefore am I still a lover of the meadows and the woods and mountains. A different lover, right? It's as if he's matured in his relationship with nature, He's become a more thoughtful lover of nature. And of all that we behold from this green earth, of all the mighty world of eye and ear, both what they half create and what perceive, what the poet recognizes now, what he wasn't able to appreciate earlier, five years ago, is that the eye and the ear, they receive from the objects that they're perceiving, but they also impart, they also impute. They're giving as much as they're receiving. These objects are created, half created by the eye and the ear that perceive them well pleased to recognize in nature and the language of the sense. Now he recognizes, right? Now he recognizes in nature and the language of the sense. We think about sense as language, as communication, as this two-way street between the objects and the perceiving eye or the ear well pleased to recognize in nature and the language of the sense, the anchor of my purest thoughts. Nature and the language of the sense are the anchor of the poet's purest thoughts, his most elevated, highest thoughts. The nurse, nature is the nurse, the guide, the guardian of my heart, and soul of all my moral being. What the poet owes to nature, to the beauteous forms, to the perceptions of his senses is incalculable. He owes to them everything, all his moral being. And in this next stanza, the poet begins, Nor perchance, if I were not thus taught, should I the more suffer my genial spirits to decay. Even if, the poet says, even if he hadn't been taught to look on nature differently, to appreciate nature differently, even if he hadn't gained this spiritual understanding and connection with nature, he would still be in a good mood. And why? For thou art with me here upon the banks of this fair river, thou my dearest friend, my dear, dear friend. 
So it seems that all this time, the poet hasn't been alone. There's been someone with him. It's his dear, dear friend, somebody very, very dear to him. And the poet is addressing this dear friend directly. Thou art with me upon these banks. And in thy voice I catch the language of my former heart and read my former pleasures in the shooting lights of thy wild eyes. This dear friend reminds the poet of how he was like five years ago, of the of, of how he was like a roe bounding over the hills in this thoughtless abandon, being led by nature wherever it leads, this unmediated connection with nature, this wildness. And the poet is able to read this wildness in this dear friend's eyes. Oh, yet a little while may I behold in thee what I was once my dear, dear sister. So this dear friend is the poet's sister, and she reminds the poet of what he was like, and he, he sees in her, he recognizes in her what he was like five years ago. And this prayer I make, the poet is going to make this prayer for his sister. He wants something for his sister, wants it very much, wishes that perhaps she'll maintain this connection with nature, that she'll continue to be a lover of nature, just as he has continued to be a lover of nature, though in a different way. Right? He's matured in his relationship with nature, but He's still a lover of nature, and it seems that he, he wants this for his sister as well. Knowing that nature never did betray the heart that loved her, tis her privilege through all the years of this our life to lead from joy to joy. You know, as the poet is away from nature, as he's in towns and cities, as the, the bustle of city life is all around him, he's still able to enjoy nature because he's been able to store up this life and food. And so his relationship with nature in absence, in presence, it's been a movement from joy to joy. This joy of, of this wildness to this joy of a maturity in his relationship with nature. For she, nature, for, for she can so inform the mind that is within us, so impress with quietness and beauty, and so feed with lofty thoughts. Nature's provenance is that it can teach us, it can inform us, right? If we learn to look on nature more thoughtfully, more spiritually, then it can raise our thoughts, it can inform our thoughts, as well as give us these sweet sensations of a corporeal nature. It can also elevate our thoughts so that Neither evil tongues, rash judgments, nor the sneers of selfish men, nor greetings where no kindness is, nor all the dreary intercourse of daily life shall e'er prevail against us or disturb our cheerful faith that all which we behold is full of blessings. And you think about the poet saying this to his sister, exhorting her, to look upon nature, to learn from nature, to be guided by nature, to have her mind informed by nature. If you do all this, the poet is saying, then you'll be impervious to all the vicissitudes of life, everything that life throws against you, all of the troubles that you'll encounter, these evil tongues, rash judgments, sneers of selfish men, you're going to be proof against them because you're 
thoughts will have been elevated and informed by nature. They'll never prevail against you. It's this cheerful faith that the poet wants to impart unto his sister. All which we behold is full of blessings. Everything in the world and everything in nature is full of blessings. The poet wants all this for his sister. Therefore, he says, let the moon shine on thee in thy solitary walk, and let the misty mountain winds be free to blow against thee. Experience these haunting passions as I once experienced them. Be immersed in nature as I was once immersed. And in after years, when these wild ecstasies shall be matured into a sober pleasure, as they have for the poet, as they have in this intervening time, they've become less wild, more sober, and they will become more sober for you as well, for you, my sister. When thy mind shall be a mansion, for all lovely forms, thy memory be as a dwelling place for all sweet sounds and harmonies. When in the future your mind becomes this storehouse, this mansion for these lovely forms, for these beauteous forms, when you're able to store up life and food for future years as I have, as I am now doing. Oh, then, in, in, if solitude or fear or pain or grief should be thy portion, if, even if, the poet doesn't wish this upon his sister, he doesn't wish for her portion to be solitude and fear and pain and grief, but we get the sense that perhaps these have been the poet's portion, that he's felt all these things. And if they should be his sister's portion, he says, with what healing thoughts of tender joy wilt thou remember me and these my exhortations. If you should suffer these, if this should be thy portion, then you'll remember what I've said here at this place, uh, at this moment. Nor perchance, if I should be where I no more can hear thy voice, nor catch from thy wild eyes these gleams of past existence, if we're to be apart from each other, if we're to be far away from each other, nor wilt thou then forget that on the banks of this delightful stream we stood together. You'll remember where we were. You'll remember what we said to one another. And that I, so long a worshiper of nature, hither came unwearied in that service. Rather say with warmer love, oh, with far deeper zeal of holier love. You'll remember that I came back to this place after being gone for five years. I came back to this place not with any mitigated love, not with any less love for nature. I came back with an even deeper love of nature. Sure, a changed, a, a, a less wild love of nature, but a far deeper and more zealous love that I came back here still a worshiper of nature, still a lover of nature. Nor wilt thou then forget that after many wanderings, many years of absence, these steep woods and lofty cliffs and this green pastoral landscape were to me more dear both for themselves and for thy sake. That after everything that has transpired, Everywhere that the poet has been, this landscape is still just as dear to him, dearer even 
dear for their dear for its own sake and also dear for his sister's sake dear because it's dear to her and because of what it will mean to her in future years so i hope that was helpful to you please let me know if you'd like to see more close readings like this thanks